All right. Hello. Welcome to the E2 Review podcast. I'm Max Klinger, the host of the show. Um, um, all right. So down to business. Today's episode, um, I'll be having a chat with Yaron Brook. Yaron is the chairman of the Ayn Rand Institute and a well-known public speaker. He travels all around the world giving talks and lectures, has had articles and, uh, articles and columns published in Forbes, the Wall Street Journal, and a bunch of other places. And he's also the co-author and author of a number of books, including Winning the Unwinnable War, America's Self-Crippled Response to Islamic Totalitarianism, and Equal is Unfair, America's Misguided Fight Against Income Inequality. Among other things, he's also the host of the Year on Brook Show, which airs regularly on YouTube and is available on every podcast app. So, yeah, it's great to have you on the show, Year on. Thanks for joining me. Absolutely. It's good to be here. Right. So that was a pretty lengthy introduction. So, you know, to begin with, could you give a kind of potted summary of what your position is generally? And then we'll dig down into specifics on kind of current affairs and stuff like that. Sure. So I'm an, a, an objectivist. I, I'm, uh, you know, a supporter of uh, and adherent to the philosophy of Ayn Rand, uh, the author of Atlas Shrugged and The Fountainhead. Uh, so I very much believe in... Um, in reason, in in the you know the objectivity of reality, in um, and from a moral point of view, I, I, I believe in a rational long term self interest as uh, as the way in which one should live, and I, I you know I reject the idea of sacrifice to other people, uh, you know, and living for other people, uh, and I also reject the idea of of sacrificing other people to me that is exploiting other people. So very much kind of a rational long term self interest. And the only kind of social system, I think that if you're self-interested, you you want to live in, and it's uh, it's valuable to live in, is a system of a freedom, uh, a system in which uh, there's no compulsion, a system in which uh, y- you know coercion and force and authority are kind of outlawed, and uh, that system is capitalism. So I'm uh, I'm very much a pro-capitalism, uh, pro-individual rights, and um, and an advocate of freedom. So I know you give a lot of talks to well all different groups, but yep. on one podcast I heard you talking about giving speeches and discussions and hosting discussions and talks with kids at schools. Yep. And so, what is it you generally? I mean, I know you talk about a lot of different topics, but if you were kind of summarizing your position to those kids, what is it you generally try to get across in the talks? So, for example, I gave a talk uh, yesterday at an all girls school here in um, in London, and. Uh, the talk was basically about the fact that capitalism is this amazing uh, economic, political, social system, that it is the uh, the only system that has brought humanity out of poverty, that it is we are massive beneficiaries of the freedom that is a, that that we enjoy uh, under uh, under capitalism, and that it's it's kind of tragic and sad that it is such a malign system that capitalism is hated and despised. By almost everybody, uh, and that that uh, you know uh, only capitalism has brought people out of poverty, and and so I go through all the facts and evidence and and examples of the huge benefits of capitalism. In other schools, I've done talks on things like inequality, uh, so uh, the whole uh, campaign that exists today about the evils of inequality. So I I reject that. I I view inequality as a metaphysical fact about human nature. We're all unequal, we're all different. We're all going to have uh, produce different results if we go out there and apply ourselves to anything. Uh, we all get different grades. We all uh, have different ability when it comes to art. Surprise, surprise, we all make different amounts of money uh, given our different professions. There's nothing surprising about that. There's nothing unusual about that. And indeed, the attempts to reduce inequality, the, the attempts to artificially create equality between people always involve taking from some and giving to others, which I consider incredibly unjust. Uh, they involve coercion and force and, and basically theft and redistribution. So I give a lot of talks about uh, the, the benefits of inequality, the fact that inequality is, is a feature of freedom. It's not a bug. It's not a problem with freedom. It's actually when, you, when people are free, they are unequal. Uh, it's only, they're only going to be equal when they're not free. So I'll take freedom over inequality any uh, over equality any day. So you mentioned you you talk about some of the benefits of capitalism. What would the, what would they be like? Can, can you give an overview? 
Well, sure. I mean, uh, uh, primarily or, or most obviously, I'd say, the great benefit of capitalism is wealth creation. I mean, uh, the fact is that in a pre pre-capitalist world, no wealth was created uh, for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. Human beings were basically born with the same amount of wealth as they died with. There was no change. There was no progress. There was no advancement. You know, maybe a little bit with Greece and Rome, but then it all declined afterwards. Basically, humanity has been poor, extremely poor, not a little poor, forever. Uh, and then uh, in the late 18th century, early 19th century, uh, many countries in the West, primarily the United States and the, and the United Kingdom, embraced capitalism, embraced freedom, embraced uh, what some people call a permissionless society, a society in which you didn't have to ask permission to do what you wanted to do. And as a consequence, massive amounts of wealth were created. People, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, built businesses, created new products, um, created employment opportunities, uh, and, and uh, built new technologies. And what we got is the modern world. The modern world is would have been unimaginable 200 years ago in terms of the amount of wealth we have. We take a lot of it for granted, but it, it's capitalism that is responsible for the fact that most kids today are at school because their parents make enough money so that the kids um, so that the the kids don't have to work. The parents can work and and fund the kids' education. Uh, the, the 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 wealth created is responsible for the fact that we have. Uh, running water, we had sewage systems, we have electricity, we, you know, we, we have computers, we have uh, iPhones, we have the internet, we have all of that, all of that are products of the, the, the entrepreneurs that were set free to innovate and produce and create and build and, and, and reinvent the world uh, under capitalism. Socialism doesn't produce these results, you didn't get this in the Soviet Union. A pre-capitalist societies, feudal societies don't produce this result. Uh, the only economic system that produces actual wealth uh, is capitalism. And look, it's, and it's not just material wealth. Uh, the fact is that capitalism allows, uh, allows people to have uh, more leisure time, which allows them to then become consumers of entertainment, of art. Uh, so capitalism uh, makes it profitable to engage in spiritual activities like writing music, performing music, uh, to a much larger extent than it was possible beforehand. There's no accident that the 19th century is this unbelievably rich century with regard to aesthetics, with regard to art, uh, because, again, the human spirit is liberated by capitalism. Capitalism basically is the system of, uh, of freedom. It's a system in which you don't have to ask for permission, you don't have to get approval, where the government is there to protect your rights and otherwise leave you alone. So uh, there are massive benefits to being free. So one of the things that really stands out to me is that even if, so there, basically the, the standard intellectual point of view, based, what you're taught to think of as like the only intelligent way to think about society is just to start from the assumption that, oh, everything's basically pretty terrible. Capitalism's really evil and awful. Our society is horrendous. And then you have to point out all the problems with it. And I mean, I disagree with that, but also even if I didn't disagree with that, I still think you have to be making that argument from a rational informed starting point, which is at least appreciating basic facts about history and the progress we've made relative to virtually the entirety of human existence at this point. And that is like the fact that people are so oblivious to that is something which really like, it shocks me, but is also just so predictable. And it's so- yeah, it, it, It's shocking. And the fact that they're so depressed about the world today, I mean, is shocking. We live in, 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 the, in the best times ever in all of human history. We're richer than anybody has ever been on planet Earth. Uh, a, a poor person in Britain today is richer than the king was 200 years ago because a poor person today has running water and sewage and electricity and computers and things that were unimaginable to a king, the richest man in the world uh, uh, 200 years ago, even 100 years ago. Uh, and we we have no appreciation for that. We we continuously, uh, people continuously are depressed uh, and miserable and think that life is so hard and difficult today. Well, they should go and try living uh, like a peasant did, and most people were peasants uh, 200 years ago. They should try living in a world in which 50% of all children die before the age of 10, uh, living in a world where life expectancy is 35. 
um, you, you know, so your lifespan is very short and, and, and most of it is dedicated to just surviving, somehow gaining the food to survive. I, people are unbelievably spoiled by how good the world is today and they have no appreciation of it. And our philosophy is such that we relish our suffering. We, we, embrace, we embrace the darkness. We're, we're, constantly, uh, we're constantly looking for the next millennium cult to tell us that we're destroying the world and everything's in the end. It's, it's, it's a bizarre situation in which you live with the kind of prosperity you do. Now, there are a lot of problems in the world, but almost all the problems in the world that we have today um, are caused by the lack of capitalism. They're caused by the lack of freedom. And if we want to solve them, we need more freedom and more capitalism. Uh, so uh, we've got inflation right now economically. The solution to that is, you know, get the central bank off our back, get, get central planning and get government off our back. Uh, you know, uh, you've got other economic problems. They're all caused by government regulations, government controls, government taxation, uh, government intervention. So uh, the solution to whatever problems we have in the world today is less coercion, less force, more freedom, which means more capitalism. So without wanting to kind of vaguely repeat the point I just made, I'm, I wouldn't say that I'm like strongly ideologically committed in any direction when it comes to the perfect economic system necessarily. Like I wouldn't say I'm absolutely committed to free market capitalism, which is where we might slightly disagree with one another. I don't think I have a very strong opinion either way, but what I do really strongly feel is that there's just an idea so there, there's an um, amazing and almost ideologically deliberate lack of appreciation of basic foundational facts about the progress we've made and the nature of society now relative to almost all societies throughout human history and before people can overcome that i think it's almost impossible possible to have a rational under like discussion with them about what they think needs to be done because so much of what's part of modern discourse is basically based on falsehoods about how good things were in the past or how bad things are now and an obscuring of the amazing progress we've made. So I had I did an interview with someone called Johan Norberg. You probably know him. Some of the Cato Institute. Yes, I know Norberg quite well. Yeah. So yeah. he just discusses basic kind of he sets yeah. out basic facts about in, across loads of different metrics how much progress we've made. So when it comes to things like child mortality rates, they've dropped at historically unprecedented rates. Healthcare has increased amazingly technological advancement life expectancy almost every measure has increased and it's increased almost exponentially since capitalism started and even over the last 50 years or so has seen an, a huge huge jump um, yep. but that's more or less corresponded with an increase or at least a consistent level of criticism of the system and saying the system is coming to an end and it's failing and can't function properly Yep. Um, so is that something you encounter when you speak to these kids at school? Because oh. what, what, I think schools are kind of key at spreading that type of propagandistic understanding. So what, what's your experience with that? Well, absolutely. I mean, nobody appreciates what capitalism has done and, and, and the kind of uh, how rich we really are. They constantly complain. They constantly look for holes uh, in, in, uh, in my argument. They, they constantly look for, for reasons to be depressed about the world. Um, it's as if the starting off point is things can't be good uh, because we've been told they're not good. I don't know, the penguins are dying or polar bears are dying or something, so the world must be coming to an end. And, um, and that's, the, the, that's the whole approach. And, and it's, it's amazing how many kids are, are really depressed about the state of the world. They haven't even started their lives really as adults and they're already depressed about it. Um, and, and really, look, what people hate at the end of the day is kind of the, the, the fundamental idea of liberty and freedom and, and capitalism, which is the idea that, that individuals should live for themselves. Uh, it is, it is the self-interest that is embedded and, and in, implicit in capitalism that, that people reject and therefore they're willing to find any imaginable flaw in the system uh, and reject it. And it starts at a very young age, sadly. What do you make of the state of kind of education in general and the, what kids are being taught politically? So, so a lot of people, myself included, think that in schools there is a really serious problem and it goes beyond schools, but especially in schools is like a key place where this happens of kids basically being taught 
ideological dogma constantly and I know it's not it's not taking place all day every day in every lesson and it's not even necessarily conscious on behalf of teachers but almost every measure they ever, ever do political leanings of teachers for example finds that they're massively lean disproportionately to the left and to kind of mainstream leftish um, ideological positions on almost everything and that's definitely reflected in what the kids are being taught and what you are and aren't allowed to learn about and think about and the ways you have to think about that that's kind of my take on it but is that something you think is really an issue or is that overrated? yeah no i think that's absolutely right i think it's worse in the united states uh it's better in the uk but it's still bad uh, i'll give the uk schools credit um i speak regularly at high schools in the uk uh even though the teachers clearly disagree with what i have to say they keep inviting me back um, it, clearly I create real dissonance, cognitive dissonance among the students. And I'm sure the teachers get a lot of tough questions afterwards. Uh, they still keep inviting me back. So, uh, and this is true of independent schools. This is true of grammar schools. Um, this is true of a variety of different schools. So it's not just one sector. I have spoken at high schools all over, I'd say the London and Oxford kind of area, even, even for the North and Oxford. And it's the same pattern, you know, the, the, the teachers are a little shocked, the students are surprised, but they keep having me back. So I'm not sure that would happen in the U.S. I think the U.S. schools are much more ideological. I think the teachers unions in the United States are much more powerful in terms of dictating both curriculum and in terms of being out there on the left and much more protective of their students and much less likely to expose them to alternative points of view. So uh, I give, in spite of the ideological bias that exists among teachers. I give them credit for, for willing to bring in alternative voices in the UK. Uh, it's, it, look, it, 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 teachers are just a reflection in the end of the universities where, where we really have lost the game, if you will, is at the universities. Universities are dominantly left. It's not even close at the university level, particularly in the US. It's something like 80 to 90% of all professors are, are left and many of them radically left, way out there on the left. Uh, and as a consequence, they're the ones who train the teachers. They're the ones who train other intellectuals. They're the ones who are invited by the media to come and comment on, on events of the day. And when you lose the universities, you lose the culture. So it's very difficult to, to, to debate. Um, it, it, the universities are where they tell kids stories about how capitalism is horrific and capitalism has done all this harm and capitalism is destroying the world and has destroyed the world. It's at the universities where you really get the ahistorical, complete lack of appreciation for what's happened over the last 200 years. And then the universities are then teaching the teachers to do that. So if you wanted to change things, the, you, you, you've got to start by changing the teachers' teachers, and those are the university professors. Right? Unfortunately, that would require replacing them because you're not going to change their minds. They've got too much, too much, um, you know, uh, committed to these uh, kind of uh, anti-capitalist ideas. Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll go beyond that and say it's not even just anti-capitalist necessarily. It's not just an economic issue. It's, it's more no. like the cultural left. So a lot of these people- Well, might... it's, it's, it's philosophical. They, they, you know, they, they question objective reality. You know, they're very postmodern. They're completely subjectivists. Uh, they, uh, they definitely culturally are, are, are subjectivists and anything goes. Uh, today, they are also- uh, you know, uh, uh, identity pol politics and intersectionality and all the nonsense that the left has come up with. Um, but also, and maybe more traditionally, they've been Marxists and, and, uh, and economically and culturally, and that has impact the way in which they look at the world and it certainly impacts the way they view capitalism. Yeah, I looked at one, so there was one study which was done, well, there's a couple actually, and I think it was done about 10 years ago when things were way less extreme than the hell now, which found that something like 50, 40 to 50 percent of sociology professors or maybe it was 30 to 40 percent of sociology professors identify as either radical left activist left or marxists which is yeah. like almost half of all yeah. sociology professors and the rest are kind of independent or democrat type or yeah. liberal labor type in the uk and in america i think they found in one study that one percent or less of sociology professors were openly republican and yeah. that's just republican it's not even like trumpist or very right it's just like anything which isn't democrat or independent in the u.s and then yeah, I mean, no, obviously, absolutely. That, yeah that, i mean there may that, be other studies but that's like really like it's really it does seem like a very profound issue in our society today to me 
Yes, and 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 if the universities if the universities are dominated by them, then the culture is dominated by them. Then they 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 have disproportionate power over what happens in the world. And one of the most shocking things that's happened in the last ten years or so is uh, how these radical leftists or or these wacky leftists have turned against free speech and and have become you know dramatically anti free speech. And of course. Once you start silencing your opposition, then there is no opposition. Then, then you're the only voice that's heard. So, um, it's it truly is uh, scary uh, when uh, 80, 90 percent of professors. I, I think that's exaggerated, but uh, it, you know, suddenly a, a significant number of professors won't tolerate alternative views and 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 are willing and support the silencing of alternative views. Yeah, that also just. The amazing thing about that is how almost it's become something which you don't even really notice anymore because it's so commonplace. So for, just to give one example, last night I went to see you give a speech and I was talking to the guy who was at, at London University and it was the London University Society of Students who put the event on. And that wasn't a huge event. It was just a smallish event with you yep. giving a speech to maybe like 40, 50 people. And the guy just casually mentioned to me afterwards when we go into the pub, oh yeah, but by the way, we had to have this event um, outside of the campus because it's almost impossible to get an event like this at campus because there's just too much like there are too many barriers to it basically and it was because of the ideological position of the society and the type of events they want to put on and I just like that's just one example and ju just in the, like you taking you as an example you faced at least one attempt to cancel your speech just this year just in the UK right? I mean I've, I faced uh, it two uh, attempts to cancel my speeches in the UK, one at Exeter University, one at Bristol University. Um, uh, you know, again, the event last night was supposed to be at King's College and King's College won't have me back because years ago, Antifa attacked me at King's College. And, and uh, so, so somehow they blame me rather than blaming Antifa. <laughs> um, it, 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 you know, and in the past, uh, again, uh, there were attempts to cancel me a few years ago at Exeter and, and at other places in the US as well. So yes, I mean, uh, and the fact that administ university administrations tolerate this nonsense, uh, uh, sanction it, and then you know blame me again, like at King's College, is is ridiculous and pathetic. And uh, universities, which are supposed to be the bastions of free exchange of ideas and free speech and uh, and openness to to radical and new ideas, uh, it, it, it's it really is tragic to see them succumbing to kind of this uh, this kind of attitude. So relatedly, something which I find really, really terrifying and have been trying to point out for a while now is the spread of this ideological worldview beyond just universities, but into more or less the mainstream across the board. And a lot of media organisations, huge media organisations, for example, and huge corporate enterprises push a lot of this ideological narrative on people. But they they wouldn't consider themselves to be far left or anything. It's just kind of entered mainstream liberal acceptable discourse sure. as a set of kind of assumptions you're not allowed to question. They just have to be accepted as facts. Yeah. And that's now reached the point where on social media platforms, for example, even expressing a lot of views which run counter to that is quite likely to get you either kicked off, potentially shadow banned and I know that's like a hazy error but essentially it means pushing down the visibility of what you write because it's considered unacceptable or you're going to face calls really aggressive calls that you get uh fired that you get silenced that your show gets taken down as happened to for example Joe Rogan but there are countless examples yeah. um so what's your take on the state of free speech on for example social media platforms at present well, I mean, first, I think it's important to differentiate between uh, what social media platforms do. They are, at the end of the day, private organizations. They can do whatever the hell they want. And and between government censorship. So, uh, you know, what we really want to avoid is government censorship. And unfortunately, in the UK, you have all kinds of government censorship. You have hate speech laws. You, you literally will put people in jail for things that they say. Um, uh, uh, you know, social media can't do that. They can withdraw their service. But then, you know, that service was never yours to begin with. Uh, you know, if, if they have contracts that are ambiguous enough that give them the right to do whatever they, whatever they want, basically. Um, so so it's, it's, it's not quite the same, but it is still sad to see that uh, many of the social media platforms are restricting what they're allowing 
to be said, and they're not allowing kind of a free exchange of ideas on their platforms. I think the world would be healthier, and I think social media platforms would be healthier if they allowed more speech rather than less. I, I don't know how they make the decisions. I don't know what, what goes behind it, but it is sad that they, that they won't allow for a broader discussion and, and more voices to be heard uh, on their platforms. But again, it's their platforms. They can decide whatever they want. Yeah, yeah. So I've heard you say that before. I thought you might say something along those lines, but I that's an area where I'd slightly disagree with you, just in the sense that I think it I, I think it more or less does amount to the public square now. So if you look at Twitter, for example, or Facebook. Well, but I don't believe in public squares. I mean, uh, I, I, everything should be private. Uh, capitalism, I, I'd really like to see everything private. And the fact is, it's not a public square. Twitter was built by private individuals. Uh, it's maintained by private by a private company with private capital. Uh, it, 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 on a daily basis, it is, uh, uh, you know, private company that is maintaining and, and uh, sustaining the existence of Twitter and Facebook and all these things. So uh, I, I think it's a massive confiscation and a violation of property rights to then say you built it. Now it's now it's ours. Now we take it away from you. Now it's a public square. Uh, it, there is no such thing in that sense. Yes. It, what is it? Regents Park or Hyde Park. You can stand at the corner and say whatever you want. Um, but, you know, that truly is, in a sense, a public square. Plus, it's a place that's specifically being assigned to be a place where you can say whatever the hell you want. Um, yeah. you, you, you can't do that. I'm sure you can't do that in the middle of Piccadilly if you just put, took out a, a little stand and stood up and started spouting all kinds of stuff. At, at some point, they would take you down. So um, there is such a thing as private property and a private property people have a right to, to, to use that to define the terms of use of their own property. Yeah. So yeah, I, I don't understand that. But I would just tend to think, think that realistically, almost everything, any major story or any attempt to get anything spread out to beyond just your own small circle of people listening to you now more or less relies on social media. It's where, the vast majority of people's visibility comes from, apart from specific media platforms themselves, which are also very ideologically biased in most instances. So to, like the classic example would be that it's true that Twitter is privately owned, but there are always massive pushes to get people silenced on those platforms. And that in itself, in my view, suggests that people trying to silence them realize the influence that the ability to say things on Twitter has on public discourse. Absolutely, it has massive influence. Doesn't change the fact it's private, right? Yeah. So you can have a, a massive private, uh, you can have a private company that has massive influence. Uh, CNN is a private company. I think it would be wrong, and it has massive influence on people. It would be wrong to then come into CNN and say, no, 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 you have to have three conservatives for every three liberals that you have, or you have to give a voice to Iran. You have to invite yeah. him to come and interview you. Well, there's no difference between CNN and Twitter in that sense. Uh, it, again, it's, it's, it's a massive influence, but it's a private company. They get to choose what they do and you don't like it. This is the beauty of capitalism, right? You don't like it, compete with it. Or as the case may be, if you don't like it, buy it. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and that's the beauty of what's happening, right? The, the, the thing that's exciting about Elon Musk, is not that I think necessarily Elon Musk is going to solve all the problems of the world by buying Twitter, but it's the fact that I've been proven right, right? That is that capitalism solves these things without government intervention, without defining it as a public square, without trying to force them to do it. People don't like what Twitter has been doing, so they buy it. You know, so here comes Elon Musk. He's going to buy it. He's going to try to change the terms. You'll see that they, nobody will be, there'll still be people who are unhappy. There'll still be people who claim that they're being silenced because you cannot create a neutral algorithm and Elon Musk will not be able to create such an algorithm. There'll still be some people preferenced over other people. It'll just be a little tilted more in the direction of greater uh, exposure to marginal ideas than less exposure to, to, to what are considered marginal ideas. Uh, but yeah, that, it, what a beautiful solution. He, he didn't like how Twitter was run, so he went and bought it. I, that can only happen under a, 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 a kind of a semi-free, I mean, a free market or a semi-free market as we have today. Yeah, so I really want to talk about the Elon Musk situation because that is a really incredible development, in my opinion. But first of yeah. all, do you not think that the, so in the US, for example, in tandem with Elon Musk buying Twitter, essentially saying that his reasoning is largely that, or partly that he wants to make it more open to free speech and less censorious, which I think is, 
whatever you think of Elon Musk is an amazing development if it works out well. But in tandem with that, the US government has announced this kind of disinformation board, which is essentially, I mean, there is a lot of disinformation out there, no doubt, but the idea that A, these guys are going to be able to unbiasedly police it and B, the idea that that's even something which the government should be doing in the first place terrifies me. But there, there are literally clips of the new disinformation leader woman saying things like Republicans are disinformers, saying that any discussion of critical race theory in the classroom, like any criticism of the spread of critical race theory is disinformation, basically. But questioning the Republicans' entire platform, more or less, and saying it is disinformation. So that is something which is an example of the government actively trying to police something happening on this private platform. So is there not a contradiction there? Yeah, but this is what you guys have been, this is what all my opponents have been wanting all along, right? You've wanted government, government intervention to make Twitter, uh, you know, more open to more ideas. You've wanted the government to step in. Well, you got what you wanted. The, the government is yeah. not stepping in. So uh, I wasn't calling for the government to step in, by the way. But yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, but this is, this is, this is the most ominous development in American politics maybe ever. I, uh, yeah, a I disinformation agree. board is the most horrific idea imaginable. Uh, and look, uh, it's not like when Republicans uh, get into power, they're going to do away with this board. I can guarantee you, I'll put money on this right now, that when whoever the Republican nominee is, when they get into power, they're going to keep the disinformation board and they're going to declare critical race theory and everything the left stands for is disinformation. They'll do exactly what the Democrats want to do to Republicans. Republicans will do to Democrats. This is why I want government out of the realm of ideas. I don't want them defining any of it. I don't want them intervening in Twitter, in Facebook. I don't want them anywhere near social media, anywhere near the internet, anywhere near ideas. None of it. Um, in terms of Elon Musk, yeah, I mean, this is the most... This is fun. It's exciting. Uh, again, it proves my point that capitalism sorts this out. If there's people unhappy with the fact that there's not enough speech, not enough variety of speech on a platform, somebody can step in, take it over and change the rules, change the way it's played. Um, I'm excited to see what Elon Musk does with it. I generally like hostile takeovers. I think the idea of, a, of somebody saying, I don't like the way this company is run. I could do it better and putting their money where their mouth is and taking over a company, I think that's one of the great advantages of capitalism. That's one of the real beautiful things about capitalism. They might succeed, they might fail, but they're putting their money where their mouth is. Um, it, Musk is going to have to make it profitable because he's got a lot of, it's not all his money. He's borrowing a lot of money. He's going to have to pay back that debt. So he is going to have to find a way to make Twitter profitable. It's not profitable today or very difficult. It has a hard time. Uh, being profitable. Profitability is going to depend on advertising. Advertising might depend on advertisers saying there's certain types of speech we don't want to advertise on. So it's going to be interesting to watch how he tries to solve the problems. I think overall, he, he's smart. He's amazing. Uh, he's, a, he's an amazing businessman. Um, he's, I mean, I disagree with him on a lot of things, but I also agree with him on some stuff. So I, I, I think it's just going to be fun to watch. And I think overall, it'll probably involve a significant improvement on Twitter, both in terms of the tools we as users of Twitter have at our disposal, in terms of monetization, and in terms of uh, a, a broader spectrum of speech being allowed on Twitter. I think all of those are positives that Musk hopefully will, will, um, will bring forward. So do you not think, because to me, the I mean, I agree with a lot of that, but I, I also think that the response to him taking it over and the things he said in particular has been so predictable and it's just is so revealing in such an unbelievably like predictable way. Absolutely. He, he's, now, he's now affiliated supposedly with the right. So yeah. the left is freaking out, even though remember that Elon Musk was a huge Obama supporter. He, he's been affiliated with the left most of his career, most of his life. It's only in recent years that he's decided that the kind of the far left, the, the, the crazy left is too wacko for him. Um, on most issues, I don't think he's particularly uh, free market. I don't think he's particularly uh, on, on, on the right. Um, you know, for example, he's for socialized medicine in the United States and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see what his political evolution actually is. But yes, people are freaking out. I love it. it it's fun to watch. Um, and, uh, 
and you know, let's see what he actually does with it. That's that's going to be interesting, and let's see how people respond to it. So there's no downside in my view to this. Um, whether he succeeds or fails, it's going to be, from my perspective, going to be interesting and fun to 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 watch it develop. It's it's also just there are so many aspects to this, but it's so funny and it's so predictable the way that they try to villainize him. As in, like I I have no idea. Like I don't think it's necessarily the ideal situation to have to be dependent on one guy and his personality for things to work out well. So I don't want to be saying, oh, he's definitely the most amazing guy ever and he's going to solve everything. But basically just taking the situation as it is currently, he's taken over this company and he's basically said, okay, I think there should be free speech in general as a principle for everyone. I think this is important in a free democratic society. And just saying that has resulted in all the people who for ages were saying, oh, there is no restriction on free speech on Twitter anyway. Everyone can say whatever they want and there's no ban. And anyone who claims that anyone's getting shadow banned or that anyone's getting censored on Twitter is just making it up and it's conspiracy theory. All those people are suddenly saying, oh my God, having freedom of speech in general on Twitter is going to be the end of the world. This proves Elon Musk is like a fascist right-wing lunatic, even though he's literally just said, basically, I believe that in general people who I disagree with should be allowed to say stuff. So yeah, just- he's saying what, what the left has traditionally advocated for, and he's saying it, and they're flipping out, which which is revealing them to be, uh, you know, promoters of restricted speech. And uh, no, we've definitely. known that, and now it's now it's out in the open. But and I would it- say that's central. That's more or less central to their current worldview, not just the left. A lot of like mainstream liberal outlets, like CNN, for example, they're absolutely desperate to restrict people's ability to or well a lot of them i mean they're desperate to i mean if you think fox is a bastion of free speech then you, you, you know that's not true either no right? i don't think i don't think fox is a bastion of free speech either necessarily but i think that it's not something i think that this censoriousness when it comes to um presenting people saying things you disagree with online as misinformation which needs to be shut down at the moment is being spearheaded in the mainstream space by people who would traditionally describe themselves as liberal and left. That's not to say that I don't think there are those forces on the right either. Well, I'll, to I'll me, just it seems like in the mainstream. The, the Fox has, has basically banned me during the 2012 election because I was too critical of, of presidential candidates and uh, of the Republicans. Uh, they, 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 since 2016, they basically banned me from Fox completely because I was too critical of Donald Trump. Um, uh, and and you go in front of a Republican group, a right wing group, and advocate for immigration, and they will shout you down, they will yell you down, they will cancel yeah, yeah, yeah. you right there on stage, just like yeah. a left wing group will. <laughs> so I'm 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 while I'm I agree with you completely about the the evil of of the left and and the thing. I think the challenge that we live, the world in which we live today, is that if the right got a hold of social media they would clearly ban a lot of speech that they didn't like. So I don't believe today that it's only the left that's, that, that, that wants to silence people. I think it's across the political. This is why I think it's so scary. If it was just the left, yeah, we can overcome that. We can fight them. The problem today is that, that, both, that the right is adopting the left's tactics when it comes to this. And what we're seeing is an across-the-board agreement on the fact that it's okay to silence the other side it's okay to to cancel people, um, even though the right claims them all high ground. I don't think they have it. Um, so I'm worried about free speech. I, I'm worried that, uh, b- because of this disinformation board. I, I worry about the governmental level. I worry about real censorship. Right now, uh, you know, Musk, I think, is relatively a voice of sanity. And uh, you're seeing the left freak out about it. Um, It'll be interesting to see if he actually implements everything he wants to implement, um, what kind of pressure the right puts on him, uh, and 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 whether they'll you know there'll be pressure on that side as well. But um, you know, again, I I I think yes, the the, the left has been the voice uh, that has been primarily behind censoring and canceling. What scares me is that the right is trying to catch up with that, and that we now face a unified field out there of people who just want to reduce the amount of speaking that happens yeah well yeah no i i have i agree with a lot of that i have no doubt that if they had as much institutional power a lot of the same people on the right would be potentially yeah. pushing for similar types of censorship mm-hmm. although to me it just does seem salient that for example with this elon musk takeover looking at it from a neutral standpoint because i wouldn't very strongly identify with any position on the political spectrum it's it's the same people and it's the same outlets who are predictably 
sure. demanding more censorship. And that has tended to be liberal mainstream. It's, it's all the left. Yeah. Because and, because but, yes. Elon Musk is viewed right now as coming from the right. Who exactly. knows where he's actually coming from? So, all right. So sticking on the Musk vague topic, um, not just on the censorship, uh, censorship issue, but also just generally something which is kind of almost hilarious to me, but also really, really off-putting is the way that his he is criticised many in many he, he's been criticized before the takeover but many of the things he's criticized for are things which should in my opinion be being celebrated so for example he created the world more or less from scratch the world's biggest electric and autonomous vehicle company simultaneously is more or less leading the charge of humanity to become multi-planetary as he puts it basically go to mars he's leading the space race he's involved in like so many different companies like Neuralink. Yeah. brain machine interfaces he's also trying to increase the free speech stuff on twitter but that's just kind of like a side issue which he's doing which is ne never let's dominate the news but then for, for for doing this he's criticized by for example elizabeth warren who's like a leading left-wing politician in the yep. u.s for being yep. a freeloader she refers to him as yeah when her entire life has essentially been just more or less like not doing anything very effective in the political sphere and then she's calling someone who's trying to make all this active change a freeloader as if he's wasting time. Um, AOC calls him a billionaire who's just trying to get attention, stuff like that. It's like they're so, so, so critical of this guy. No, it's disgusting. It truly is disgusting. And, and, and look, Kate, now I, I'm not a big fan of Tesla because uh, really the company was, was only survived because it got massive government subsidies, uh, both in terms of carbon offsets from other auto companies uh, forced by the government and direct subsidies, both from the federal level and the state of California. But look, what they really don't like about Elon Musk is that he is an optimist. He is a kind of person who is driving humanity forward, is making the world a better place. He talks beautifully about mankind's need to be an interplanetary species, about uh, you know a positive future, a future that in which we can thrive and be successful. And that is particularly on the left, it despised and hated because, you know, they believe the world's going to end tomorrow. They, they, want, they want all this money going for poverty relief as if, as if redistribution of wealth has ever relieved poverty. So time and time again, he comes out and he says, we can do anything. You know, we can be successful. We can achieve great things. And that they find offensive uh, and, and, and they rebel against that. And you're seeing this hatred now. On top of that, the fact is that Elon Musk became the richest man in the world without really generating a lot of income for himself. That, right? Most of his wealth, all of his wealth, is basically tied up in stock in different companies. Because that stock has never been realized, he actually hasn't paid a lot of taxes until recently when he started selling stock. So they're all up in arms because the guy's not selling, paying a lot of taxes. He's not paying a lot of taxes because he doesn't, his wealth is all paper wealth tied up in stocks that uh, have not been sold uh, and that we don't tax that. And, and it would be insane to tax that. But then recently he sold a bunch of stock and it's turned out, I think that he's paid more taxes than any human being has ever paid on planet earth or something like that. Um, but they, you see, they view the left views your value as a human being, not by what you achieve, not by uh, the progress you make, not by the technology you invest. They view your worth as a human being by how much taxes you pay, by what you contribute to the government, to, to the, the, the force that is the only good in the world, right? They view everything as government-centric. And you might invent a technology that changes the world and it makes the world a better place. doesn't matter. Did you pay any taxes? They don't want individuals to, to prove that they can change the world. They want it all to go through government. They want government to get all the credit. They want central planning. They want complete control. They are authoritarian in their soul. And uh, they hate uh, individual initiative. They hate individual entrepreneurs. They, 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 you know, they despise all of that. Right. Tangentially, what do you make of that? Because I know this is something you wrote books about. A while ago and I don't know how much you address it now but it's something which I talk about a lot on this podcast what is your view of 
um, the discussion around radical Islamism and Israel, because this is only tangentially related in the sense that it's a topic that if you try to discuss, you'll face a lot of pushback yeah. from the similar types of people we've just been discussing. Yeah. If you say anything out of the specific kind of rigid ideological barriers on either side of what you're allowed to think, um, but I don't agree with them on that. So what's your take? Well, look, I, I, I think that um, radical Islam or Islamofascism or Islamic totalitarianism, which is a term uh, we kind of adopted at the Iron Institute after 9-11, or jihadism, however you want to call it, the, 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 the commitment within a certain percentage of Muslims to a, a totalitarian view of the world, to imposing their religion on the rest of us, and to using violence against anybody who stands in their way, that is an evil ideology. Uh, it manifests itself in evil, that is in terrorist attacks and, and attempts to, to, to scare us into submission. Um, and it has to be recognized that there is that that uh, uh, idea, that ideology within the world of Islam. How big is it? How popular is it? How influential is it? That's an empirical question. And, and it, it, there's a variety of different views on that. But it is out there. And, uh, and it is an ideology that needs to be destroyed because it's, it's not within the realm of ideologies that we say, okay, um, yeah, we're, we're, it's just a disputation. It's just a matter of arguing. It's just a matter of reasoning. These people want to use violence against me. And the only way to suppress somebody who wants to use violence against you is to use violence against them. Uh, so I, I'm a big believer in destroying the ideology of Islamic totalitarianism, both intellectually and uh, militarily, physically. Uh, I, I think one has to identify the sources of this ideology. And I think in this sense, Iran uh, and, uh, and in the past, at least Saudi Arabia have been major sources of ideology, and that needs to stop. And it needs to stop uh, either, you know, maybe Saudi Arabia, we can influence on them to stop funding these things. Uh, Iran, you'd probably have to militarily stop them. But uh, the last thing you want is for a regime like Iran, who believes in this totalitarian ideology, to get nuclear bombs. And, and this is why I think it's so important to restrain the Iranian regime. So how does that relate to your understanding of the situation in Israel and the Middle East more broadly? Well, look, Israel is a free country. It's a Western country in a sense of its respect for rights and its respect for property and its respect for free speech. Uh, it is a, it a Westernized country in that sense. It's a good country. It's not an ideal country. There are lots of problems in Israel, and I'm a huge critic of Israel, particularly when I'm in Israel and talking to Israelis. Uh, there's a lot of things that Israel does wrong. But fundamentally, it is a good country. And fundamentally, its enemies, particularly Hamas and Hezbollah uh, and the Iran, Iranian regime and, and through the Iranian regime, the Syrian regime, they represent uh, the, the, this totalitarian Islamic element. They are the enemies of the West. They represent uh, violence and suppression and authoritarianism and really totalitarianism. Uh, and to the extent that Israel is at the front line of this battle between the West and totalitarian Islam. We should support Israel's attempts to defend itself and to defeat uh, Islamic totalitarianism, whether it's to defeat Hamas and Hezbollah, or whether it's to take out the nuclear program in Iran, uh, or, or, to, or to suppress the rise of Islamism uh, in Syria. Uh, all of that is something the West should support, and therefore it should support Israel and it, it, its attempts to do so. It used to be the terrorists in Israel were primarily secular. The PLO was a secular organization, but that has shifted completely. Now, uh, the, the enemy Israel faces is really an Islamist, jihadist, Islamic totalitarian enemy. So I think, do you think there's any relationship between the, the two issues you just discussed and then how we're kind of generally taught to think about it in the West or what the kind of standard view of the conflict is and do you think that shifted over time and, and if so how well there's no question i mean uh, uh, basically uh, we resent in the west the left has taught us and, and to some extent christianity has taught us to resent success to resent prosperity to resent um uh, strength uh, and when when israel was poor uh, when israel was weak 
when Israel was viewed as just a bunch of Jews who, who, who had just survived the Holocaust and could do, you know, could barely survive. Everybody loved Israel. That's before the 1967 war. When Israel won a war in six days and defeated the armies of seven Arab countries, it suddenly was proven to be strong and powerful and successful. Suddenly, particularly in Europe and, and the left in America, flipped. They, they, from loving Israel, they turned to hating Israel, and then they looked for somebody who was suffering and weak, and, and that was the Palestinians. Uh, you know, we resent anybody standing up for Western values. We resent anybody standing up for their own success. We resent that self-interest, uh, and we're seeing that, uh, you know, all over the West. The West is becoming more and more anti-Israeli, um, and, and to some extent, again, uh, you know, the, 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 the left, uh, it, it's, it's broader than just a, the far left. It's, it's all over Europe. It's certainly in the UK. You're seeing more and more resentment towards Israel and tolerance for the violence of uh, an authoritarianism of Islam. Uh, so all over Europe, European countries are cowering. We'll make fun of Jesus. We'll make fun of Jews. We'll make fun of anybody. We won't make fun of, of Muhammad, God forbid, right? Um, and uh, we, we take down paintings in museums. We, 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 we silence ourselves. We don't say certain things. Hate speech laws in the UK prohibit you from saying certain things about Islam. Um, we are basically cowering before this ideology. I, uh, have you got time for one more question? Or sure, that? sure, quick question. Right, so the one more thing I really would have, I wanted to ask you quickly about, because I've heard you mention it once, is that you used to be super left when you were like 15 or something. And that's- Yeah, super, I mean, I used, I, yeah. like everybody growing up in Israel, when I was uh, 15, 16, I was a socialist. I was very much a collectivist. I was very much what you'd call a Jewish nationalist um, and a socialist at the same time, just like most people in Israel were at the time. And-, and Luckily, somebody handed me a cap copy of Atlas Shrugged, uh, and that, that completely changed my life and flipped me completely. So uh, uh, while I fought the book, uh, at the end of the day, Ayn Rand won. Uh, so I encourage all your listeners to read Ayn Rand, Fountainhead, and Atlas Shrugged. And uh, it's a, it's a, it, whether you agree or not, it, it's going to be a profound experience because it'll challenge your beliefs and it'll, it'll cause you to question what you believe, no matter how way you land up in the end. It, it'll be good for you. All right, awesome. Well, that's a great point to end. So you're on. Thanks so much for coming on uh, the E2 Review show. And where can people find you? Like, is there anywhere they can follow you? Yeah, I, I mean, just Google my name, you're on Brooke or, or on YouTube. I have uh, I have a, a very active channel. I put out a lot of content uh, on YouTube. Uh, hopefully uh, you can subscribe to my channel. I am on Twitter. I haven't been kicked off of Twitter yet. I'm on Facebook, although I, I don't get Facebook. Facebook is a black hole for me so I, I don't quite understand how facebook works uh, so I, I spend more time on twitter and but primarily on youtube you can also find information about ayn rand at aynrand.org a-y-n-r-a-n-d.org awesome all right thanks a lot for coming on the show thanks max thanks for having me on